Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. We would love to hear from you, so please send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have Father Tom Morrow, and we've had him on before, but now we're talking about a new book that he's authored. It's called Christian Dating in a Godless World. Is it possible? It's possible. We, yes, it is possible. <laughs> uh, sometimes you feel like you're holding back all of the forces of hell and darkness, and just to say, can we do this? Well, he's written a great book to tell us how yeah. we can do this, how to reset, how to stay set, and to be holy in the process. Great book, especially for teenagers, college students. Uh, you want to share with your loved ones about Christian dating in a godless world. This is the book for you, and this is the season to be chaste, to be holy, to be obedient. It was amazing to go to Vigil Mass on Saturday after the Thanksgiving weekend, a long, endless weekend, it seemed for us. It was wonderful, over th about 30 people that we had over. Our cup runneth over. And I was sitting down Saturday evening, sitting in the pew and reading over the readings. And, you know, I knew Advent was coming, but yet it caught me by surprise. <laughs> and so I was like, I was reading the readings, you know, be alert, be awake, get up, don't sleep. And I'm saying, I'm it, exhausted. No, I said, I said, I said it, it's Advent, it's Advent, you know. Yeah. And, and I didn't know, like, I, I knew, mm -hmm. but I didn't know. I felt so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sitting there saying, I always know when Advent's coming, and I'm preparing for that, but I, I'm not ready. And that's the point. It may not be a good thing to miss kind of the liturgical season of Advent, but if you miss what it's about, the coming, Adventus, means the coming of the Lord. God with skin, God made poor, God with a face, this child who's God incarnate, God divine, the second coming of the Lord. He's coming to be the judge of the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And so our, our Romans reading last Sunday mm -hmm. and the gospel lesson, wake up, don't sleep, don't slumber. And St. Paul says it in Romans, don't, don't, don't dwell in darkness. Mm. Put on the armor of light. Have done with jealousy and rivalries. And he says, have done with promiscuity and lust. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so fitting with Father Mar, he's going to share with us about Christian dating or chastity in a godless world. But do you really believe the Lord's coming? Remember that, that song some years back? Will you be was, ready when he comes? Yeah. That's, that's one of them. You don't want me to sing it. <laughs> But this other song w was speaking as Jesus would be speaking. He says, I hear that you say I'm coming back soon, mm. but you act like I'm never returning. D do I live that way? Because when I was caught by surprise just about Advent, I'm saying, am I living? You know, am I saying I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world? Am I just mouthing mm. things or am I intentional? Do I believe that life is, is moving along a line and coming to a close, that this life is coming to an end as we know it, and Jesus Christ is coming. Am I living that way? Or will the thief come and break into my house and I'm not ready? Are you ready? Am I ready <laughs> for the coming of Christ? Because if you were ready, you wouldn't go to sleep. You'd mm -hmm. watch over your house, the house of your own body, your marriage, your family, especially the men. Be watching over your homes and, and persevere until the end so that you'll be ready for the coming of the beautiful one, the holy one, the pure one, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. I love Advent. You do love do. Advent. It, when it was so beautiful. I mean, for years, when, we, when you were an Episcopal priest or a, we did that and you prepared them. That was your whole Thanksgiving weekend. You did Thanksgiving and then you, you hit it, the floor running because you had to get the church ready. You had to get the Advent wreath out and do all that. And it was beautiful to walk into the St. Paul's. And I know that there were women who adorned our parish and had the Advent wreath so beautiful and they were working and preparing. But it really is a time. It is a happy new year, right? Happy new it's year. It's happy new year for the church where we prepare where we prepare for the king. And, you know, we just had lots of people over for Thanksgiving. We prepared. We prepared our house. We prepared with food. Mm. We prepared. We did a lot of stuff in preparation. That's, uh, that's what the word says. They were given in marriage. They were eating. They were drinking. But they weren't preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. Right. Should he come, would we be ready? Any day. So it's going to be a wonderful show. 
Father Tom Morrow is the author of a great book called Christian Dating in a Godless World. We're going to reset. It may be this yeah. new year. Maybe this is something you said, you know what? I need to get my life straight with the Lord. Maybe I have been promiscuous in the past. Maybe I've compromised in ways in dating in my life, in my journey to holiness. Well, well this is going to be a great resource and a beautiful conversation to have with Father Tom to share. So if you want to be a part of the show, just give us a jingle or send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Father Tom Morrow will be right here in the house on At Home with Jim and Joy. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guest, Father Tom Morrow, give us a call during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, it's Advent. It's the first Monday in Advent. I'm awake and I'm ready Amen. to have this wonderful interview with Father Tom Morrow, who's the author of a great book called Christian Dating in a Godless World. His website is cfalive.com. Well, Father Tom, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. You were here before and you did such a great job. We said, let's get him back here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, tell our family back home in case they missed your first interview a little bit about yourself, how many years you're a priest and where you're working now and what God's doing in your life besides authoring books. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm uh, ordained about 34, 34 years. Um, I um, serve in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., and uh, I um, got a degree at the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family, uh, a doctorate in sacred theology, and uh, I work a lot with young adults. I founded a couple of young adult groups, the St. Catherine St. Lawrence Society, uh, who uh, meet monthly and, and talk about how they can grow in the faith, and they have some wonderful events that they sponsor every year. So uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Why such a focus for you, Father? You can, you're an intelligent man, many fields, but you, life, marriage, family, seems like such a <coughs> central part of your life. Why have you been led in that way or chosen that course? Well, I think I was in, influenced by uh, St. John Paul II. Uh, to, and he made a tremendous effort to build up marriage in the church and uh, help married couples to to live the faith, and I, I just um, I was ordained under him, you know, when he was the pope, mm -hmm. and uh, I just said, yeah, that that makes sense because you gotta you gotta increase improve the whole uh, yeah. uh, situation of marriage in order for young people to get the message and to yeah. to see what it what it takes to become a good Christian. So um, that was my interest from the, from the get go. And uh, I'm also, when I was a young single guy and dating until I was uh, 33, uh, I uh, often wondered, well, you know, this is difficult to try to live the faith and everybody else is not living it. And if I ever get a chance, I'm going to uh, work with young people and help them mm. to have the opportunity to live the faith and to really pursue yeah. the gospel in their lives. Yeah. And as I was asking you why the focus and I said, life, marriage, family, why such a thrust? And I thought to myself, you know, if I was saying that 50, 60 years ago, th that would, like, life, marriage, and family would be just uh, kind of a, a general understanding. But as I said it, I said, you know, that's really prophetic. Yeah. And it's a shame it is like a prophetic yeah, edge right. now, life, marriage, and family. That's, but like 60, 70 years ago, that would be like, well, that's what we're all doing, well, right? It's more or less of a given, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So the title of your book is uh, Christian Dating in a godless world? Right. God yeah. That's it. 
Yeah. So that, that really says what you were saying before of, if I'm really going to be a Christian, this is going to be tied into how I treat other human beings. It's tied Absolutely. into chastity if you're going to be a true Christian. That's right. a prophetic word, a true word. So tell us about the book and about the title and why, and why did you write it? <clears throat> well, uh, when I first moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, to serve at the cathedral, there was a young adult group there, and there were about six or seven members of the group. And I, I, I said to them one day, I said, you know, I think if we had a seminar on Christian dating in an oversex world, I think we could get 60 people. And they said, Father, we've never had 60 people for anything. Yeah, let's do it. So we set it up. We're going to have three Friday nights, 6 p.m. to about 8 p.m. or whatever, 8.30. And um, we put, got a nice Norman Rockwell picture for our flyer and sent it out. And we had room for 100 people. The first, the first night we had to turn 20 people away. Mm. And I said, oh, my goodness, people <coughs> really want to know about this. They, they're, they're fed up with the situation as mm -hmm. it is. So uh, after we did that, um, there were some people that were upset that they didn't get to go. <laughs> yeah. So we ran it against the next fall, and we had 115 people yeah. every week yeah. for three weeks. Yeah. So uh, then it occurred to me that uh, there could be a book uh, from, from all this. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I, I was writing a column for New Covenant magazine from Mike Aquilina, and I... And, um, Mike said, well, I gave your name to the publisher and uh, he's going to contact you because I said, I, I think Father Morrow probably has a book in him. And so he contacted me and I re recommended the title and he said, yeah, that sounds like a good title. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And so actually what happened was um, I submitted the outline and sample chapters and they wrote back and said, well, we don't want to publish your book now because we're going to publish another book by a beauty queen on chastity. And so we don't want to work against ourselves. Yeah. So, but if in, a, if in a year you don't have a publisher, let us know. Well, I wrote back and said, I won't have it done for a year. Yeah. So they yeah. sent me it a contract perfect. right away. Beautiful. <laughs> that, you know, and so the people that turned out, their hearts were hungry. Yeah. And their hearts were hungry for the truth. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And so how did they respond? Were the people, with the makeup of the people, what was their age in the group? And well, they were, were they um, single? Where, where, where was probably it Probably like? 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they were all single. It was, all, it was just for singles. And um, the way we, we handled it the first time we had the, the seminar is that we had a quota of 50 men and 50 women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had the same, same mm -hmm. number mm -hmm. of men and women. Uh, I don't remember what the breakdown was in the second one. But we, had, we ran the same seminar several times in Washington. And uh, we, were, we always got a good number of people. So, uh, but these were people, you know, young professionals. And uh, they were not satisfied with the, th the way things were going. And I would say probably... Um, maybe the women might have been more interested in the men. I said at the, at the seminar, I said, well, I'm glad to see all these women who are interested in uh, learning about Christian dating in an oversex world, and I'm glad to see all the men who are interested in meeting the women that are interested in, mm -hmm. in learning about that's Christian right. dating. That's right, that's <laughs> right. How different is it in dating for men and women? In your book, what, what do you tell us? Well, um, it's it's... Women have suffered more from the, from the sexual revolution. Um, men, um, unfortunately, get away with more, um, but the, still, it, it still hurts men uh, uh, deeply uh, because uh, sin is the worst part of it all. But um, affectively, it, it hurts women more because when a woman has uh, relations with a man, um, it, her body produces oxytocin, right. and so that's a bonding chemical. Uh, a man does produce oxytocin, but it's blocked by testosterone, so there's no effect like that for a man. So a woman feels committed, and a man does not. Well, if one's committed and the other is not, um, the one who feels committed is going to put up with bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what happened. I mean, w women got worse and worse behavior from men, and... Uh, so the feminist revolution came along and said, well, we're not going to take it anymore. And their analysis of the problem was great. Unfortunately, the solution was worse than the problem. And that is, that, well, we'll just be like men. We'll treat this like the way men treat it. And women can't do that, not, not and be, be true to their hearts. Mm -hmm. So the body, the actual chemistry 
in most cases for a woman, and I guess it varies in terms of the chemical and its release. I understand this is a chemical as well. It has to do with pregnancy and bonding with babies and uh -huh. stuff. But, but, but the body is saying when we are getting intimate here, we are really encountering, it's getting emotional, it's getting physical, it's getting touching the senses, that, that the body is saying this is meant for a committed relationship. Absolutely. And, and for guys, that's a little bit less in terms of the chemical. Right. And it could be, well, this is, this is simply pleasure and delight and, and this is you know, a, a one-time encounter or a hookup or whatever it is. This is yeah. just a nice thing. It feels good. But in the woman, it's more likely to say commitment, dedication, protection. It's about just, the whole person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, go on, ahead. on a daily basis, you know, we work at a pregnancy medical center and we see the wreckage of humanity from making poor life choices of multiple partners, sometimes average, I'd say, 15, 20 partners. Mm. Um, and they're <clears throat> in their early 20s. Um, you know, they became sexually active early on. And so what they're finding is there's a really hard time it bonding with a man right. and now they hate men right. and you know and now I don't need a man well obviously you do need a man because you he's impregnated you here mm -hmm. you know so you did need a man so how how do we how do we change this how do we how do we combat this to say that's a lie well just by speaking the truth and John Paul II gave us a lot of uh, good uh, data in uh, his two books. Uh, the, the first book was uh, Love and Responsibility, yeah. and uh, that's a lot easier to read than, uh, than The Theology of the Body. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in both of those, he, he, he talks about the truth of humanity and, and uh, what fulfills us. And, and um, you know, the social sciences are our greatest allies in, in promoting chastity. You know, the, the divorce rate for those who have uh, had sex versus those who have not is considerably higher, uh, you know, and, and those who are chased before marriage do much better in marriage, much lower divorce rates. So, so cohabitating, yeah. trying out one another, seeing if we want to really be together, let's do this for a week, a month, a year, three years, that doesn't lead to a committed long lasting. Well, cohabitation, the, the, uh, the divorce rate is something like 50% uh, higher mm -hmm. wow. if people cohabit. Uh, now, some people say, well, yeah, that's because people that don't, don't cohabit have much more of a conservative approach to life. And I said, well, that's true. But we're not suggesting that you uh, have this left-wing approach to life and not cohabit. We're saying it's the whole pro uh, the process of the gospel, the, the whole gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not saying, you know, just, right. just because you don't cohabit and you, you have a liberal lifestyle, and that doesn't mean it's going to help you. No, it's not going to help you. It's going to help you if you have the whole gospel lifestyle. Right. Yeah, I forget who said it, and we were talking a little bit in the back room, that um, you know, it's not just simply saying no, it's the greater yes. Yeah. That's what I think I hear Absolutely. you saying. There's a greater yes. There's a holistic <coughs> yes. There's a yes to what it means to be a human being. There's a yes to the way of sacrifice, the way of intimacy, and the way of love. Absolutely. Love. Absolutely. And a yes to the person. Mm. It's all about the person. person. John Paul II makes that very clear yeah. in Love and Responsibility. Yeah. Uh, you got to connect with a person. And I do say in the book that, um, that uh, uh, hugging is very important in courtship. In fact, I've had a couple of couples where I've worked with them and I said, look, uh, why don't you j try an experiment for, for a month or two? Um, uh, the only kiss I want you to do is good night, tender, gentle kiss, but I want you to hug each other several times during the evening. I hug, I hug a lot. And so I said, you can hug two or three times in a row if you want. And uh, so uh, one couple came back and said, hey, Father, it's working. We like it. Mm -hmm. We're not having sex anymore. Mm -hmm. But we're having a good relationship. Right. So, and, and actually, uh, hugging is uh, one of the things that marriage counselors have to encourage people to do because very often if people have... Um, had rather a promiscuous uh, premarital relationship, um, once they get married, they don't hug much. Right. Well, they got to get back to that. And actually, um, there's actually, they've done research and they've found that uh, couples that hug for 20 seconds at once, one, one of my parishioners yeah. said he thought it was 20 minutes. I said, no, no, <laughs> easier on your wife. <laughs> 20 seconds 
um, that it actually produces oxytocin in the woman, mm -hmm. and it lowers her blood pressure, mm -hmm. and it lowers her uh, her, her um, level of uh, of stress uh, a stress hormone. Mm -hmm. So. Um, now, I, I don't recommend 20-second hugs during courtship because you don't want to be chemically bound in the courtship. But, I mean, 10 or 15-second hug, you know, that's pretty special yeah. in a courtship. Yeah. That's beautiful. 10-second hug is, is really nice. So, uh, yeah, we have to uh, encourage couples after they've been married uh, a while to, to get back to, to hugging because they, they hadn't been doing it. Right. And they find that it really is, is very good for bonding. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, it's all about intimacy. Mm -hmm. That's what people want. When, when people, a guy goes on a date with a girl, if he has a good heart, he wants intimacy. But what he does is after a while, after they kiss for a while, then he's willing to settle for pleasure. Right. And pleasure is, is not a good substitute for intimacy. Yeah. They're both good in the right place. Right. But pleasure is nothing compared to intimacy. What are some of the key components within intimacy? Because it seems like it's more whole than exactly. just pleasure. Pleasure could be a part of it, yeah. but intimacy there is seems There is a certain amount of pleasure in intimacy, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but intimacy is about uh, connecting with you as a person, uh, knowing what you like, what you don't like, knowing uh, what makes you tick, what your goals are, um, what, what you want to do in this life. And right. if you want to be saved, um, those are things that that are, are really uh, beautiful to be able to share with somebody. And we do, we do want to have intimacy with other people. Right. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a natural thing. Mm -hmm. right. And actually, I, I just wrote something about pornography and one of the writers on pornography said, he said, you know what, if, you have, if you're involved with pornography, you have no intimacy, no intimacy. It's all about intimacy. And I said, yeah, that's cool, because yeah. he he's came to the same conclusion that I came mm -hmm. to in a different right. way. Right. Yeah. The illusion, though, in the world is that that in pornography, it's a false intimacy. I mean, it's just, it's so broken and fractured. It's broken. yeah, it's empty. And so for then, like you said, like everything needs to be restored. Everything that got stolen right. in relationships and in encounters of the other needs to be restored in marriages, in relationships. So if a couple comes to you... Father and they have they have already um, been sexually intimate, but they want to reset themselves. Sure. Right. What what would guidance and counseling? What what would you say to them? Well, you, you have to be careful where you're going to be. Okay. Um, you you don't want to sit on the couch and kiss for a half hour and expect you're going to be sh chased. It's very unlikely that you're going to be able to do that. So if you're going to sit on the couch. You put your arm around your girl and you and you you cuddle, and uh, you talk about things. I used to when I was dating, I would put my head on the lap of my girlfriend and we talk, and I kiss her hand and hold her hand and all that. And that one married guy said, "Tell Father tomorrow, I'm doing that in, in, in my marriage now." Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's doing with his wife. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's about you know just dialogue, going back and forth, kissing someone for a long time long period of time, even if it's, it's, it's just affection, even if it's not heavy kissing, is not a way to get to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of dating and courtship, the purpose of courtship is to get to know somebody and to know if we're compatible. So, um, you know, couples have to be able to realize that, uh, as you say, there's a, there's a falsehood to this way of life that our culture so pr take, promotes. So take us through, uh, you know, what is dating you mentioned friendship dating right. and then courtship. And right. you know, share with us a little bit about that and where does a couple begin that's just getting to know one another? Yeah, I've encouraged, uh, actually some of the couples that I work with said, Father, when you write this book, be sure to tell people not to get so clinging right away. And uh, so I, I do recommend that um, they pursue friendship. And you don't just say, I just want a friendship because that's, that's a put down. You say, well, let's start with friendship and see where it goes. And so couples that have done that have found that it's worked pretty well. One woman, one woman said she would have broken up with a guy if she hadn't been in a friendship situation mm -hmm. in the first three months because she didn't like him that much. But after three months, she started to like him. And then the friendship kind of made it possible for them to enter into courtship. So uh, it's a beautiful way to start. And some couples actually 
naturally started with friendship. And some of those relationships are quite, really quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they've been seeing each other as friends for uh, two or three years, and, and all of a sudden they look at each other. One looks at the other and says, hey, I think I want to go out with her. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or oh, the beautiful discovery of the journey of a relationship. So I really like you. Yeah. You know, I like things about you. I like being with you, whatever, you know, with, that we're doing together, whether we're going to ball games or and now I have friends who go to the shooting range for dates and it's just a crazy <laughs> world. But I mean, but it's those things that we have in common, That's right? Then to say, That's this it. is a fun thing. I want to be with you and this is, this is good, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I think where we are as a society and a culture, we've so lost our way from that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we see clients who come in and they've been impregnated by him and they'll say to me, it's not like that, Miss Joy. I'm not even in a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, something went down here. You are in a relationship. But there's no connection to That's that. Right. So, so we have to fix so this. So they're pregnant, but I'm not in a relationship. <laughs> how, what would you say to them? Uh, how would you help them to understand? Because I think they're really being honest about where they are. I'm not in a relationship, but I'm pregnant. What do they mean by that? Or what? Yeah, well, it's, it's the whole, it, it's basically the, the hookup culture, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, trivializing sex. Right. That's what's happening. It's, it's sex is being trivialized. And so uh, people need to realize that it's something beautiful. It's something important. And um, a lot of people resonate with that once they hear it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do they ever hear it? Let's pause there. Father Tom Morrow is here with us speaking about Christian dating <coughs> in a godless <coughs> world. It's cfalive.com. We want to hear from you. Very important matter. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for Father Tom Morrow, give us a jingle right during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. We're having a beautiful conversation with Father Tom Morrow, an author of a book entitled Christian Dating in a Godless World. You can go to his website, cfalive.com. Father Tom, you were sharing about a special offer for our yes, viewers today. Yes, we've been given a grant to provide uh, free copies of the book uh, to the first 30 groups, uh, whether it's young adult groups or college groups, Catholic groups or whatever, uh, that uh, apply uh, for free, a box of 32 books for, for whatever for group each applies. Group that applies. Right. And wonderful. they would just uh, contact me at tgmorrow and the number one at gmail.com, tgmorrow1 at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to send them a box of books. We've already done that for a couple of groups. That's so. a beautiful offer, yeah. beautiful study that the yeah. students can do together. Yeah. So that's a great, great offer. Yeah. Tell us more about the book. And I think you had a special quote that you oh, wanted yeah. to read to us. This is one of the most interesting, because I did a lot of research for the book. And this is actually uh, in, the, in the second edition of the book. Uh, a woman by the name of Hepzibah Anderson uh, wrote a book um, because she decided to go for one year without having any sex. And the name of the book is Chastened. And she wrote in the book, as soon as I went to bed with a man, I'd lose my clear sense of perspective. I had constantly mistaken casual hookups for rose-tinted beginnings. However uninvolved I started out, however uninvolved it seemed I was supposed to be, I could not remain cool-headed or cool-hearted as the temperature shot up. To admit as much felt like letting down the sisterhood. I knew that as a woman, my right to sexual expression was hard won. Yet that ideal seemed to have been watered down to become intimacy without intimacy. Mm -hmm. While it is billed as empowering to be able to love and leave a man, 
like a man. To me, it felt like I was denying a whole set of instinctive feminine, res feminine responses, forcing myself to conform to decidedly masculine relationship ideals. And what a waste of energy all this weeping seemed. So here is a woman who has no apparent connection to religion right. at all. And she's giving us a natural law understanding yeah. of why all yeah. this stuff yeah. has not been working. Yeah. That's a great, great title, Chasten. It's kind of a double entendre regarding chastity and being chaste and really learning and saying, what I bought into as a radical feminist doesn't work in reality because there's no real intimacy that's here. And I can't just walk away from all these guys that I'm, right. I'm in relationship with and I'm, I'm being chastened. Yeah. And she's not even Christian, right? No, I mean, she gave no indication of any religious affiliation. Well, in bravo life. for her. I mean, yeah. you know, to yeah. put that out. She, she, she came to the truth um, by the back door, I guess. Well, the, I, <laughs> and we encounter this, you know, Father. The, the law is already written on her heart. That's it. And her That's true, it. authentic self, right. she's saying, this is not who I am. Right. I'm not a man. I'm not, and, and I'm not this way. Right. And you can't deny who you are. We're all made in the image and likeness of God, whether we are aware of his presence or not. That's right. In That's that right. way. The law is not some arbitrary thing that God put out there that has nothing to do with who we are. Mm -hmm. It's based on our nature. And John Paul II called it, uh, said we don't have a, a heteronomy that is something that's apart from us, uh, the moral law. The moral is, he said, a theonomy. This is in Veritatis Splendor, mm -hmm. one of his great encyclicals yeah. on the moral life. And he said, a theonomy, it's, it's how we, we live as human beings and how we fulfill our own human nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's powerful. Well, we're going to go straight to an email. It says, there is such a high incidence of single parent families today. Do you think the lack of adequate male role models harms girls because they don't have good examples of what to look for in male suitors? Someone who will treat them <coughs> with the respect they deserve. And this is from... Iris from Smithfield, Rhode Island. Yeah, we could use a lot more good male, male role yeah, models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage people, if they want to get close to God, is to read the lives of the saints, because there's some wonderful role, role models there. Even, yeah. even St. Augustine, who admitted his great errors yeah. with regard to women and how he, uh, how he reformed. And, you know, he prayed at one point, Lord, yeah. give me chastity, but not yet. Mm -hmm. But then he realized, and he has this beautiful quote in his uh, autobiography about how, uh, how late have I loved you, so, oh beauty so ancient and so new, and so on and so forth. It was wonderful what, what he yeah. discovered yeah. when he turned to Christ and turned to God. But yeah, we do need role models, and I do recommend uh, the lives of the saints for that. And people like, you know, Joe Gibbs and people like yeah. that have written, written good books about how to be a, a decent person. Well, the role of a father in affirming, you know, his daughters and, and his sons, while it's no guarantee, it goes a long way. Because there's just nothing like uh, a young woman who understands her preciousness, uh, the beauty of her own being, that she's accepted for who she is, not for what she does. And that's really critical because in those, these dating relationships, it's like you're going to get acceptance by what you do for me. Yeah. And the father, exactly. we all got to do things. But, you know, the father is... You know, I, I affirm the essence of you being simply because of who you are. You're my, you're my daughter. And takes that essence out and kisses that and puts that back in. So that as she goes into the future, she could be solid in herself. And if, if it's it. not going the way she would like it to go or it's not going the way he wants it to go, she knows who she is. Again, it's no guarantee, but it's, it, goes a, it goes a long way. If she has a good relationship with her father, yeah. she will have self-confidence. Yeah. And that's extremely important. And she will also be able to live this yeah more easily because she knows that she's appreciated and that she's special. And so it's ex the role of a father, especially for a daughter, yeah. is extremely important to give her self-confidence. I have five nieces who they all have great confidence, yeah. self-confidence. Mm -hmm. I said, that's my brother-in-law that did that. He gave, he gave them that. They all are very self-confident. Yeah. So, you know, is that the role of a husband is irreplaceable in that regard. And you know, we're only studying more and more about the, that recently in the last 10 or 15 years about the importance of a father. Well, we always knew the importance of a mother. Mother's yeah. extremely important. But uh, 
Now we're learning yeah. and we're discovering more and more. Now we're, we're learning the in the midst of a culture that says marriage doesn't need to be between a man and a woman. It could yeah. be two women. You really don't need a guy. Or it could be two men. You really don't need a mother. Mm -hmm. And you're saying all the data is right. saying the direct opposite of, right. of that. That's right. The social sciences are always our best friends. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Tell us about your teaching on love within your book. You have several teachings on the different aspects the four, of love. The four types of love, yeah. Yeah, yeah I use... Uh, I use, uh, I, I Catholicize uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, book, The Four Loves, okay? The first love is uh, uh, agape, uh, which in Greek, which means uh, uh, giving of oneself for the good of the beloved without conditions. And if you look at that, that's the way God loves us. And that's the, the love that will bring us salvation. In, in scripture, when the Lord said, you must love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself, the word in Greek is agape, okay, or agap agapao, all right. And so then you have friendship, which is, uh, uh, now the first one is the divine love, all right. The, the, the next three are human. Friendship is the most important of the human loves, after divine love, of course. And that is uh, where you see the same truth or you share a common interest and you're able to uh, just connect that way and, uh, and serve each other and uh, build each other up. And um, then the third is affection. And that's, uh, that's where you, you have a tender feeling towards someone. Uh, and affection, of course, expressions of affection, of affection are extremely important in a marriage. I was just thinking earlier that uh, John Gottman wrote a book uh, about why marriages uh, succeed or fail. And uh, in his book, he says, well, if you have, uh, you, you can't go along and not have any arguments. You, you have to, you know, talk about stuff. But if you have an argument and it's, it's rather unpleasant, you need five positive interactions to balance that negative interaction. Wow. So, yeah, uh, a hug, uh, a touch on the face, right. a kind word, all these different things. You need five of those to balance a bad interaction with your spouse. And, um, the, you know, a lot of people are, well, they don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's extremely important. So uh, affection is very, very important. And it's, uh, very often the women are more affectionate than men, but there are, there are exceptions to that. There are definitely exceptions to that. And uh, I, as a priest, you know, some people come up and hug father, you know, and all that. It's, it's great, you know. It, it gives me joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to, to be able to do that and not want anything else. No, that's right. enough. That's enough. I'm happy with that. Right. Uh, we have to be satisfied. If we're going to be good Christians, we have to be satisfied with uh, small amounts of, of uh, fulfillment and, and, and pleasure. Mm -hmm. right? And then the, the fourth uh, of the four loves, uh, let's see, affection, uh, friendship, and... Uh, Agape. Was the well, first. That was the first mm -hmm. one, yeah. And uh, intimacy is it emotional? Well, intimacy comes with, with affection mm -hmm. and, and agape, but uh, I guess um, the sexual involvement and, and that, of course, um, has a lot of uh, things that make it right and, and make it fulfilling. And if you have the intimacy with this person and you're married and you honor each other, and that's another thing, you know, couples they have to love and honor each other for as long as they both still live. But if you honor each other, then that's gonna be very beautiful and very pleasant uh, and, um, and very fulfilling. So uh, all these things work together, but mm -hmm. the queen or the, or the king of all those loves is agape. Um, I'm concerned for you, good. I want you to be happy. And it would be to the point where a man would say to his girlfriend, look, if you could be happier with some other guy, that would make, go ahead. That's what I want. Yeah. I want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love you that much that I want you to be happy. And if, if we had that kind of love for people, uh, we'd, things would be a lot better mm -hmm. than they are now. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to go straight to an email. It says, with all the technology, many young people seem to prefer communicating through texting and social media, avoiding personal interactions. How does someone develop one-on-one -on -one relationships if they can't put away the technology? And this is Sam from Anaheim, California. That's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. You gotta. You gotta. Uh, you gotta work on the personal uh, relationship. But I don't. I have no problem with texting here and there because it's a little love note, whatever, right. and that's fine. But um, 
if people are glued to their phones, well, yeah, they're, they're not going to be able to, to love anyone. You know, I, we took a young woman out for her 16th birthday once, and she was on the phone every couple of minutes. Mm. Said, What's this? You know, mm -hmm. she's not with us. Right. <laughs> she's uh, she's uh, she's glued to that, and and she she doesn't know how to to stop it. So we need to have situations where we go somewhere, and we leave our phones behind. Yeah. We need to have those situations, and uh, it's just so important for parents, grandparents. There's a real place. You know, we have 16, you know, beautiful grandchildren, but we try as best we can, and I hope the parents appreciate it. I know that they do. Just take a little bit of time with each one of those kids, and, you know, you're able just to touch them for a moment, put them up touch on your lap, yeah. look right into your face. You know, I love your face. I love looking into your eyes and your face. There's yeah. nobody like you. I know we have all the grandchildren, but you're the only Cecilia. You're the only Josiah. You're right. the and, and I think, you know, once they encounter that, then they, you know, Facebook is as interesting as looking into somebody else's face, right? right. And having that conveyed, yeah. and learning how to love, learning how to convey that. You know, then say, "I love you too." No, no, I love you, Bob. I, say, oh, I feel so good. But if we're not having that interaction, like you know, they don't even know why to be invested in it. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of the kids that uh, are using their phones a lot, they do have a personal relationships with certain yeah. people, but some of them are so glued to it that they just can't. They, they don't have time mm -hmm. for a personal relationship. So I think that's what the, uh, the uh, person who wrote the, uh, the email is thinking of. And it was a rhetorical question. Yeah, how can you do it? You can't do it. <laughs> well, Father, thank you so much for this conversation, holy conversation. Thank you for your latest book of uh, chaste, well, dating, Christian dating in, in a, a godless, godless world. world. <laughs> and also, if you want that book, there's some groups that can get that book. All you have to do is go to tgmorrow1 at gmail.com, and Father will gladly send you a supply of those books. The first 30 offers, right? First 30 offers. That's 30 it. groups, over 30 books per group. 30 groups and 32 books per box. That's, That's right. Deal. That's a great deal. Yeah. So if you're ready to change your life, Christian Dating in a Godless World, that's the book for you. Well, don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family, and you know that you can join us here live on At Home and be a member of our studio audience. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department and do that by emailing them at pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966 and make your plans to come to Irondale, Alabama, we would love to have you. Well, right now we're gonna go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to everyone at home. And as it was around the world, the news of the death of Fidel Castro was news here. And the Pope, as a matter of fact, on Saturday, sent a telegram to Cuban President Raul um, Castro offering prayers for the death of his brother Fidel and entrusting the nation to Our Lady of Charity of Colbre. And in very carefully scripted terms, the Holy Father wrote, on receiving the sad news of the death of your brother, His Excellency, Mr. Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruiz, former president of the State Council and the government of the Republic of Cuba, I express my sentiments of sorrow to your Excellency and to other family members of the deceased dignitary. And he said also to the people of this beloved nation. At the same time, I offer prayers to the Lord for his rest and I entrust the whole Cuban people to the maternal tenderness and protection of Our Lady of Charity of Cobre. Now, in September 2015, Pope Francis became the third pope to visit this island nation, following the January 1998 visit, the first ever, by Pope John Paul, and then, of course, a visit in March of 2012 by Pope Benedict. 
And it's interesting because Pope Francis' decision to go to Cuba right before his U.S. visit last year was seen, among other things, by many as kind of a, his reminder to the American people of the Vatican's view that the embargo, the crippling U.S. trade embargo, really was unjust and should be lifted. And by the way, of course, Pope Francis and the Vatican uh, were heralded as helping thaw relations between the two countries that led to diplomatic ties. Now, Pope Francis and Fidel Castro met for a half an hour in uh, Fidel Castro's residence, September 20th of 2015. And the Vatican described the meeting as cordial, informal, and familial with an exchange of books. And they also discussed big issues facing people around the, the world today, as well as the Pope's encyclical that had just been released on the environment. And by the way, this Jesuit educated Fidel Castro turned to Francis and he said, by the way, what does the Pope do? On that, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much for that report, Joan. Certainly a lot of mixed reactions mm -hmm. and feelings regarding oh, yeah, Fidel Castro's is, yeah. passing. And that last question, what does a pope do? Certainly in the pope statements, yeah. the, the pope extends mercy mm -hmm. and hope sure. and grace and, yeah. you know, and says, you know, we wish well for that country That's and for right, this individual yeah. who's passed That's on. That's what we do. We pray. You know, you pray for, of course, the God have mercy on his soul and uh, we also pray for those who were hurt by him. Mm -hmm. You know, many of them are upset. They're very angry right now. And we pray for healing. Amen. Know, we pray for God to grant them the grace of, of much healing. To be an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, to be good out of this. Father, how are you? Uh, how are you doing these days? Oh, well, I'm doing well. Praise the Lord. Thanksgiving into you know? the season yeah. of Advent now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, Advent, preparing uh, our hearts and souls for the birthday of Jesus. Yeah, it's gr good times. Yeah. You know? yeah, I love the four-week period, mm -hmm. you know, the focus. I love purple yeah. in terms of, it says sure. a little bit about repentance yeah. and sorrow, but says that the king is coming, that's keeps it. the focus. You know, where that, that's where we got to keep our focus is on Jesus Christ. And, you know, I'm so happy that uh, Father's here at this time, the beginning Advent at, at here, you know, speaking about relationships, because this could be a very lonely and uh, very painful time for, for people. You know, they, uh, maybe somebody, a loved one pass away or, Maybe they haven't found a, a special person to have a relationship with. And so they, you know, it's, it's, it can be, yeah, a very hard time for people and, you know, very easy to get into depression and all this. But, but Father spoke very well because he tells us, well, of course, you know, keep your eyes on God, but uh, about true and authentic relationships, you know, mm -hmm. intimacy versus pleasure, you know, agape love. And these are things we all should be searching for. But everything is found in Jesus Christ, in yeah. the Lord, you yeah. know. Yeah, like, True happiness. It's interesting to hear the word friendship afresh yeah. and anew, mm -hmm. godly friendships. Yeah. And I think that's something that is so mm -hmm. lost in our right. country and in the world today, especially mm -hmm. among our young people. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this mindset, well, if we are going to be together, this hookup kind mm -hmm. of mentality, then it's got to be expressed in these kind of physical ways, some mm -hmm. of the greatest acts of intimacy, mm -hmm. but there's no intimacy there. Instead of saying, we can actually be friends to, That's to, right. to know one another. Mm -hmm. I want good for you. I'll try never to do anything that will yeah. hurt you. And I want to I want to facilitate mm -hmm. God's plan for your life, for that which is good yeah. you know, for your life. And, and you, right. I want to know what interests mm -hmm. you. Yeah. What, do you, what do you like? What's going on? I want to enter in as much as I can. Friendship needs that, to be That's very important because then you discover what is, what is good, true, and beautiful, which is what's, what God has given to us, you know, who, who he's, what he's made us to be and, you know, our intellect, our, our skills, our talents. If we're just so focused on the pleasure, you know, we miss all of that, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and then, uh, and, and so, so yeah, this is where, where we need to be is a yeah. true friendship seeing the, the true inner beauty of, uh, of every human person, uh, you know, made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. We really have to pray in this church of the new year and mm -hmm. in this Advent that there really would be a great awakening mm -hmm. yeah. in the hearts of, of this world that is so sexually saturated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I meet with clients, mm -hmm. they don't even know the guy's last name. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just, yeah, that's just sure. how, to, I don't know his name. Mm -hmm. No, I don't, I mean, no, I'm not in a relationship. I don't want to be with him, but you were with him, yeah. you know, and, and how do we, you know, how do we reset that? Mm 
-hmm. How do we present it in all of its beauty and splendor and truth? Mm -hmm. I mean, and really the church is the only place that has the answer. That's it's right. not going to yeah. compromise, mm -hmm. right? So we have to tell it. We have to let our light shine. We have to call everybody mm -hmm. back to revival mm -hmm. and to renewal and, and healing, and and healing yeah. from the past in That's ways right. that maybe we've made poor life choices. Maybe mm -hmm. we've compromised. Well, it's a time to go to confession and to reset mm -hmm. and to say, no more. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want God's plan for my mm -hmm. life. And there's so much hope, you know, mm -hmm. so much hope that we find in the church from the comfort, from the love of Jesus Christ Amen. and the body of Christ, you know, people like you doing good things and the center and all that, other groups out there. And the Father was talking about young adult groups. All There's so mm -hmm. much there, mm -hmm. you know, it's just our, our openness to it. Right. You know? yeah. Amen. Well, Father, why don't you lead us in a prayer and give us your sure. blessing? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the wonderful work you're doing in the show and in Father Tom and his ministry. And we ask you of, for continual blessings of increase of your love and peace. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You. May you be filled with God's hope this new year, this Advent season. Christ is coming. Christ incarnate, the holy face of Jesus in that little child. Christ is coming again to take you to be with him, that where he is, you might be always. Christ is coming right now, perpetually coming to you with his divine affirming love, saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my bride. Remember, you're an important part of this family, and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.